Welcome back to another episode of Introductory Organic Chemistry. Today we're going to talk about esters, ketals, and imines. But before we get into that, let's go over the practice problems from last lecture. So I assigned first this problem, where we treat this compound with an acid. And when we generate that secondary carbocation, we can actually, instead of having a full alkyl group shift, we can have the shift of this electron density. And so that once this electron density moves over here, we actually get an alkene, and we get an allylic carbocation. And so because this is an allylic carbocation, it's actually in equilibrium with the carbocation in this position. And so you can see the alkene density, electron density moving from here to here, but it can also go back. So if this gets trapped when the carbocation's in this position, we'll form this alcohol. However, if it's when it's in the benzylic position, water will attack at the benzylic position, affording this product. Now, if I had to guess, I would assume that this alcohol would be the desired one to form because it is more stable to have a benzylic carbocation and it's also a lilic still. So that's a little bit more favorable. Now in the next problem, we have tridyl chloride. We're treating it with water. Um, so this is actually an SN1 reaction because this is a tertiary chloride. It has to leave on its own first uh, before the water can attack. And so the first step of this reaction is the chloride departs on its own. This tertiary carbocation can then get attacked by water. Subsequent removal of one of those protons uh, spontaneously or by abstraction by the solvent affords this alcohol as a product. Before we start today, I wanted to uh, notify you of a couple other reagents. The first one is PCC. This is an oxidant used for converting secondary alcohols to ketones and primary alcohols to aldehydes. It's quite a popular reagent, but it's fallen a bit out of favor due to the chromium waste that it generates. Um, however, this doesn't have smell associated with it, while some other uh, oxidation methods to aldehydes do smell quite awful. Another noteworthy molecule is this organocatalyst L-proline, and this organocatalyst was actually the compound that won um, Benjamin List his Nobel Prize this year. Additionally, Macmillan and co-workers have used this type of catalysis quite frequently as well. Uh, one additional noteworthy molecule is R-binol, or S-binol as well. These binols can be good scaffolds for chiral auxiliaries, as well as the development of chiral catalysts. And so while there's no one stereocenter centered on a carbon like we traditionally have, it turns out that the protons sticking off of these two naphthalene rings uh, are so bulky that the rings can't rotate, so they're stuck in this orientation. So you can crystallize out a single enantiomer of this uh, and then do chemistry on those. So this is a useful molecule for various methods. With that, let's get to the material at hand today, esters, ketals, and imines. So last time we talked about how certain carbocations could be stabilized due to the presence of an adjacent heteroatom. So the first reaction we're going to talk about today is Fischer esterification. So in Fischer esterification, you take a carboxylic acid and an alcohol, and in the presence of an acid or a Lewis acid catalyst, we afford, uh, we're afforded with an ester as well as water. And so the nice thing about this method is it's really cheap. The only byproduct is water and you don't have to use very high catalyst loadings to get this reaction to work. Now the downside is it requires a lot of heat. Additionally, if you're using sulfuric acid as your catalyst, sulfuric acid is very acidic and so that can cause reactions that are undesirable. So in most industrial processes, what they'll do is they'll use an immobilized acid catalyst such as polystyrene uh, sulfonic acid. Uh, however, they also use some Lewis acid catalysts, such as this dichloromethylaluminum uh, complex. And so this similarly will uh, bind to the carbonyl in the mechanism that I'll show you in a minute. So if you're doing this uh, in the lab and you just need a quick dirty method that'll work for most compounds, uh, sure, you can do this. Sulfuric acid works fine. However, if you have uh, sensitive molecules, you have to use different methods. So the mechanism of this reaction is first, the carbonyl of the carboxylic acid is protonated by the strong acid. Carbonyls aren't a very good base, so it requires a strong acid for this to occur. That then activates this position for nucleophilic attack by an alcohol. Once the alcohol has attacked, water can be eliminated, uh, forming a protonated ester. This protonated ester can lose a proton just to solvent or alcohol, etc., forming the ester as a product. Now, as you can see, the only thing driving this reaction forward is the loss of water. So if you want this to go to completion, you have to remove the water. So that can be accomplished with an azeotropic distillation with a solvent such as toluene using something called the Dean Stark trap, which there's several videos of on YouTube. Alternatively, you can use molecular sieves, but molecular sieves have to be able to tolerate the acid you're working with. Otherwise, they'll just break down in the reaction conditions. 
So next, I just briefly wanted to talk about the better alternative methods for making esters. So if you have a sensitive substrate, which is most of the time in organic chemistry, you don't want to wreck the rest of your molecule. So what we do is we use a fancy coupling reagent. So you can take your carboxylic acid and your alcohol and couple them in the presence of this coupling reagent with a base, sometimes a nucleophilic catalyst like DMAP, and this will work directly. Now, alternatively, you can convert your carboxylic acid to an acyl chloride using thionyl chloride first, but uh, most of the time people use coupling reagents uh, such as these. So these are milder reagents. Yes, you have to get rid of the byproduct from these reactions, but uh, it's a convenient method that's worth using most of the time. So next, I want to talk about the synthesis of acetals and ketals. So similar to how we protonated the carbonyl of a carboxylic acid, it's possible to protonate the carbonyl of a ketone or an aldehyde. And so just like in the case of the carboxylic acid, where the elimination of water drives the reaction forward, we can protonate uh, the carbonyl and uh, lose water overall. So the exact same idea happens where first this is protonated, attacked by water, or attacked by an alcohol rather. Water can then be eliminated, forming this oxocarbenium. This oxocarbenium can then be attacked by a second equivalent of the alcohol, and through the loss of a proton, we're afforded with this acetal or ketal, depending on whether this is a carbon or a hydrogen. As I suggested in the last case, you can use molecular sieves or an azeotropic distillation to drive this reaction forward. Um, one other interesting option is to use an alcohol in conjunction with another ketal or an orthoformate. So in this example from organic syntheses, I forgot to include the link, but I'll include the link in the description. Uh, trimethyl orthoformate is able to react with acid, generating some oxocarbenium that will scrub water. And so in this case, this, this cyclohexadione is able to get converted to this diacetyl. And so the reason that this reaction is nice is the trimethyl orthoformate, which has a relatively high boiling point of like 100, once it's converted to this methyl, or methyl formate, which is the byproduct, this can just boil right off because it's got a really low boiling point. So one reason you might want to have a ketal is you can mask a ketone. So you can do a bunch of chemistry on a complex molecule once you've protected your ketone, but afterwards you want to unmask it and get your ketone back. So this is usually done with an acid or a Lewis acid in the presence of an excess of water, affording alcohol as a byproduct. Um, so another thing you can do is you can treat uh, aldehydes and ketones with uh, nitrogen containing nucleophiles such as amines. Um, however, if you have an aldehyde, this occurs more easily than if you have a ketone because aldehydes are much more electrophilic. So what can happen is the nitrogen can attack at the aldehyde, electron density can swing up, you can protonate this via proton transfer from the nitrogen, this can then eliminate water, uh, and as a result we'll get this imine. Now sometimes you will see a slight weak acid used such as acetic acid and that can help just get protons transferred around, make this reaction happen better. Um, but sometimes you don't need any other external acid. Um, so another class of nitrogen nucleophiles which form imine type substrates are uh, hydroxylamine and hydrazines. And so if hydroxylamine reacts with a ketone or an aldehyde, it's possible to form what's called an oxime. Additionally, if hydrazine reacts with an aldehyde, you form what's called a hydrazone. Hydrazones are commonly used, uh, such as like dinitrophenylhydrazine, to uh, confirm the identity of an aldehyde or ketone product. So this is an old school way of testing for the presence of carbonyls. So for practice for this lecture, I want to assign two problems. First, show what product forms when you treat this compound with uh, tosyl hydrazine, which is what this is called. Additionally, uh, show the mechanism stepwise of how we convert this ketone into this ketal using this diol. And with that, I hope this lecture has been really helpful. If you have any questions or comments about this video, please leave them below. If you have any comments about how you think the series could be done better, I'd be happy to answer them in the comments. And with that, I hope you have a great day. Thank you.